Okay, so we did the, through the meditative reflection, right? And you did that reflection last night? Okay, so we're on the section that says extending this insight to others. Okay. So it's very important that you you know are familiar with the the six factors like a bucket in terms of yourself. Yeah. And then to do it with other living beings. If you forget yourself, if you leave yourself out of it, then first of all you're not aware of your own misery and cyclic existence. And second of all, then your your compassion for others is not so strong because you don't have a, a real good sense of w what your own dukkha is. Okay? So, you know, lots of times we would rather not think about our own problems and just skip over and have great compassion for everybody. Yeah? But in the Buddhist way, you know, you have to, you know, be in touch with what's happening in yourself. Other times, we get so stuck in what's happening in us. My dukkha! You know, six kinds like the bucket. Oh, my God. You know, uh, that well, there's no space in our mind to think about other sentient beings. So that's not correct either. Okay. So we need to be aware and have a realistic sense of our own situation and aspire to be free from it and then uh, turn that towards other living beings and realize that they're in the same predicament as we are and want them to be free of it and that becomes compassion. Okay. So, His Holiness says, <clears throat> Now that you have identified the mechanics of misery in your own situation, you can extend this insight to other sentient beings suffering the same miseries. Yeah. So, you know, suffering the same miseries. Sometimes when we're having problems, we feel like we're the only one in the world who has that problem. Yeah, especially if somebody betrays our trust, you know, which I think is something very painful. It's like no one has ever had this experience as tough as I have. Yeah, no one. Yeah, my pain is, it's indescribable. Nobody else can really understand it. Okay. Actually, sorry to tell you, we're really not so special, <laughs> you know, that nobody else has hurt like we've hurt. Yeah. This is samsara. Samsara is an equal opportunity sufferer. You know, we all have these different kinds of things at different times in our life, in different lifetimes. Yeah. But it's not that our pain hurts more than anybody else's. Okay. So it's very helpful to think when we get really stuck in our own sorrow, our own grief, our own pity, our own trauma, you know, whatever it is, to, to go, you know, hey, ding dong. This is a universal experience in samsara. Yeah, it's not just me, it's everybody. Mm -hmm. And understanding that helps us to uh, pull ourselves out of the very unhealthy self-focus or self-obsession about our own pain. Okay. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. How how we get just you know stuck in our own pain. And and that is all we can see in our lives. And then of course depression follows. Okay. 
and self-pity and the whole nine yards. Yeah, When we are able to say, hey, this is not just me. This is a universal experience. Yeah, when you read the eight verses of mind training, and it talks about these different situations, or you read the 37 practices of bodhisattvas, and some of those verses talk about difficult situations, then you have to think, you know, why are they writing that in this text? Is it just for one person, me? <laughs> you know, did Tome Zamo know that I was going to come along seven or eight hundred years later? And, <laughs> yeah, is it only me? Well, no, it's everybody. And this verse really fits my situation, too. Okay. And then we realize, you know, it's, uh, this is human experience. This is samsara. That's why we want to get out. That's why we want to help everybody else get out. Okay. So I know for myself, when my mind obsesses over something, yeah, to remember, to, to step back and say, at this moment, how many people are upset about the thing that I'm upset about? Yeah. Now you might say, well, half of the country is. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, maybe not all at this moment. Maybe not upset in the same way we are. But what about our personal dramas? Yeah, that seems so overwhelming sometimes. Yeah. How many other people are obsessing about the ex the this our personal trauma, our personal drama? Okay, not not a situation in their life that's similar, but our situation because we're obsessing over our situation. Okay. And I give this example, some of you have heard it before, but um, when I was publishing a book, trying to publish a book, some years ago, and uh, that, you know, it was about a conference with His Holiness, and people had made presentations. I abbreviated their presentations because I thought His Holiness's comments were the things that were really important. Well, the people whose presentations I abbreviated weren't very happy with me. Yeah, I won't say any more. Uh, and they contacted the publisher, and then there was this big... Who and why are these people contacting the publisher when I'm the editor of the book and why is the publisher listening to them and not to me and why are these people upset with me when they gave me the job and trusted me to do it and on and on and blah 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 and you know and there's uh, and <laughs> Yeah, and if I only told you who these people were. <laughs> so, I was unhappy, I was miserable. Uh, in the middle of it all, I went to Dharamsala for His Holiness's spring teachings. And of course, my mind continued to obsess about it. What am I going to do? Am I going to rewrite the book according to what they want? But I don't think that's a good book. And what would His Holiness want? I don't think he would th want that anyway. And then, blah, 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 blah. and uh, you know, there I was in the middle of Dharamsala, so stressed out about a problem that was happening in America half the world away. And I was walking back to my room one day, and it suddenly dawned on me, you know, because His Holiness always talks about there's seven billion, over seven billion human beings on this planet. And I realized, you know, I was the only one who was so upset about what was happening. I mean, the other people were upset, but 
about different things, and they weren't nearly as upset about as I was. And it was like this big shock, like, oh, seven billion, and I'm the only one that's so miserable about this. And it really helped me put the situation into perspective. It's like, you know, this is really not such a big deal. Yeah, it's really not. So, you know, stop obsessing and go, you, you know obsessing? Yeah. Anybody here good at obsessing? Yeah, ruminating? You go round and round, 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 round. And you think the same thought again and again and again. And then you try and have a different perspective, but you come back to the same thing. And, again. and then you feel lousy and you're depressed and nobody understands you and you're in so much suffering and these people don't care anyway. And it only happens to me, you know. Yeah? And then you, at bed, you haven't done anything all day, but you go to bed and you're totally exhausted. Yeah? Have you ever noticed that? That when you get really emotional, <coughs> your energy just like is gone? Yeah? So it helped me so much just to say to myself, you know, this is not an earth-shaking problem. The planet is really going to continue with, you know, even though this is happening. Yeah, so it really helped me. And then as a result, the book did not get published. Yeah, the whole thing got canceled. And I'm putting some of the material in. Uh, it got put into um, a foundation uh, of Buddhist practice. Yeah. 20 years later, almost, and wait a minute, more, 25, over 25 years later, yeah, it's getting put into another book, but now is the right time, and it's done in the right way, okay, so, yeah, just, uh, we need to acknowledge our pain, but not just uh, spin around it. Because that spinning is a function of our self-centered mind. Don't you think? Yeah. Do you obsess for the benefit of others? <laughs> yeah. No, we, we obsess due to our own self-centered mind. Mm -hmm. Okay. However, for your... Uh, okay, so we have to... Uh, see that sentient beings suffer the same miseries, you know, in terms of the general types of miseries. However, for your response to be love and compassion, it is not sufficient just to know how other beings suffer. That's not sufficient. You must also have a sense of closeness with them. Okay, so those two factors are the, the chief things that we need to develop love and compassion. An awareness of sentient beings, dukkha, and a sense of closeness to them. Okay. <laughs> then it's only it says, without that sense of closeness, the more you know about your enemy's suffering, the happier you might be. <laughs> okay. Then he quotes Tsongkhapa. In the world, when suffering is seen as in an enemy, not only is it not unbearable, but you delight in it. Okay. So whichever party you, you know, whichever side of the aisle you're on, when you hear somebody from the other side get a little bit bashed or embarrassed, there's something and you go, mm -hmm. good. Yeah? So it's this kind of rejoicing in, in others' misery. Yeah. May they have more. Yeah. May that truck come around the corner quickly. Yeah. For the benefit of the entire country. <laughs> right? Yeah. For the benefit of the entire country. Yeah. Ho hum. Okay. When persons, this is Sonkapa, 
when persons who have neither helped nor harmed you are seen to suffer, you will in most cases pay no attention to their situation. Okay? So there's flooding in, I don't know, Oklahoma and Texas. Huh? Quebec also? Wow. And, you know, and we just kind of say, well, that's too bad. What else is new? Okay? We don't pay a lot of attention to it. Yeah. If the Newport smelter were, uh, you know, if PacWest wanted to build it in California, we wouldn't get so upset about it. You know, we'd write a letter in support or against the smelter, but it wouldn't be such a big thing. But they want to build a silicon smelter in our community and unleash how many tons of CO2 and all sorts of horrible stuff. Yeah? So we pay a lot of attention to that. So it's interesting, isn't it? You know? When we don't feel so close to people or when it doesn't relate to us personally... Yeah, we, we kind of put it on the back burner. We're not hostile, but, you know, it's like, uh, it's too much for us, you know. It's too much to, under, to take on. So this reaction is caused by not having a sense of closeness with respect to those persons. But when you see friends suffer, it is unbearable in the sense that you want to do something about it. And the degree of unbearability is just as great as your sense of closeness to them. Okay? So how unbearable we find somebody's suffering in terms of wanting to act to remove it is proportional to how close we feel to that person. Mm -hmm. Therefore, it is essential yeah, that you generate a, a sense of strong cherishing and affection for sentient beings. Because if we want to become a Buddha, we need bodhicitta. Uh, bodhicitta is based on compassion for every single sentient being, accepting none. Okay? So our Awakening depends on each and every sentient being. Which means that in order to generate the compassion for each and every one, we have to feel close to them. It doesn't necessarily mean that we have to like their personality or be interested in the same things. Okay. You know, I'm, I'm really not interested in car racing and horse racing and things like that, you know. And my mind tends to go, well, those people just, you know, why are they so interested in such a stupid thing? Yeah. Of course, they think the same thing about me. Yeah. But, you know, so I don't have to be interested in the same things. But I do have to care about them and feel close to them. Yeah? Because they're just like me in wanting happiness and not suffering. And because in our entire samsaric existence, yeah, we have been close relatives and friends before. In this lifetime, they may be strangers, but in previous lifetimes, We've been very, very close to each and every sentient being. Okay? So that includes Donnie. It includes Mitch. <laughs> yeah. That we all, we haven't been. Yeah. Or depending who you are, it includes Nancy. Yeah. So who people are in this lifetime, they don't have fixed personalities. Yeah, they haven't always been those people 
in that role, in that position, you know, in that situation, their whole lifetime, you know, in each lifetime. They've been many different things. And so in some previous lifetime, you know, they've been our parent, our sibling, our child, our lover, you know, our pet cat. Yeah, they've been everything, and we've been everything to them. So there's a sense of familiarity and closeness. The, the reason we don't notice that is because we can't remember our previous lives. Yeah. But we can't remember where we put our car keys this morning either. Okay, so just because we can't remember something doesn't mean it doesn't exist or didn't happen. Okay. So thinking of, you know, this close relationship that we've had with others, especially in previous life, is one way to generate a feeling of closeness. Yeah. And so uh, it's one of the ways that, that the great uh, sage Kamala Sila taught. And it involves, you know, thinking that all living beings, they say, have been our mother, and they emphasize the mother. Now we want gender equality, you know, so it's the fathers too, yeah. But usually it's the mothers that get up in the middle of the night and feed the kids, okay? And that change the diapers and so on. You, you got up in the middle of the night? Good for you. He has twin daughters, two of them crying. Did they cry at the same time? Okay. <laughs> yeah, they they were coordinated. Yeah, they were being kind to dad. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> They're how old now? 15? 14. 14 going on 35. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. So... Um, you know, but, but to, to think that, that people have taken care of us in that way. And watch, you know, as you go around. Watch how parents take care of their kids and what they do for their kids. And even in the animal realm, watch how they take care. You know, mama animals take care of their babies. Where I, I heard, uh, Venerable Jampa, you saw some baby chicks today, yeah, huh? Yeah, the mother, she was loving. There was a huge tree falling at him and Papa, and so the son must have, have frightened all the nun, uh, nuns' chickens. <laughs> and she was putting herself... <laughs> the mama was putting her whole body above them, and so she was close to the wall. She wasn't afraid of me. And it was neat to see that she was protecting them. Yeah. Yeah, that's what the mama turkeys do, you know, at nighttime also. And no matter how many chicks they have, they sit, they gather them all together and then sit on top of them to keep them safe and keep them warm. Yeah, it's really cute to see. And then sometimes then mama steps up and one and two and three and four, and you can't, you know, so many little chicks come out, you know. And this is what they do, even in a dangerous situation, you know. Like they got scared by this, uh, This it's a, quite a big tree, actually, that fell. You should go look. I went to look. Yeah. Um, you know, and so to think, you know, that's, that's how they've taken care of me, too. Yeah. And, and, you know, you watch with the deer, and how the mama deer take care of the baby deer and, you know, teach them what to eat, teach them where to go, keep them company, yeah. And then you think of our own parents, yeah. And don't think of them about, you know, the, the way we've been taught in our culture to think about them, you know, which is, Oh, I have so many problems because of what my parents did when I was a child. Don't think of your 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 parents that way. 
think of you know what they went through to have you. Yeah, and think of what they did to raise you. Mm -hmm. It wasn't always easy. And, you know, it depends what historical period uh, your parents were, um, you know, raised in and when you were born and what they went through. Yeah, when I was a little kid, my mom had cancer. They were you know, scared that she was going to die. And yet they kept raising us kids and they wanted to make us have a, a secure childhood. You know, when you really think of what your parents went through when they were raising us, you know, trying to get the money to afford a kid. You know, kids are expensive. Yeah. And of course, we don't think of our, we didn't think of ourselves when, as expensive when, when we were little. We just wanted what all the other kids had. Yeah. We never thought of where did the money come from and how hard our parents worked to get the money. You know, we mostly thought of what I wanted that all the other kids had, and it's not fair if I don't get it. Mm -mm. Okay? So it's very helpful just to, to really think about our parents' situation. Yeah? Instead of expecting to have perfect childhoods and have all of our needs met, because who had that? Yeah. Who had that? And so instead of thinking about everything we lacked, think about everything we had and what they did to give it to us. Because it wasn't easy. Yeah. And I don't know about you, but I was very ungrateful. Yeah, It really wasn't until I met the Dharma as an adult that I really began to think of uh, you know, what my parents went through raising us. Yeah. yeah, I mean, think about what you were like as a teenager. Would you want to have yourself as a teenager, a teenage kid? Still fresh. Huh? <laughs> Still fresh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Would you want to have a kid like yourself when you were a teenager? Yeah. But look what our parents went through, you know, with all of our trips and our insensitivity and, you know, talking back and not respecting them. And, yeah. Of course, maybe we had a few ideal children here. Anybody at the ideal child? Yeah. <laughs> oh, you were the perfect child. I'm still the perfect child. Still the perfect child. That's your problem. <laughs> you don't know how to differentiate. <laughs> yeah. So it's it's really something to, to think about, you know. And depending, you know, what was going on in the country when you were born and when you were growing up. And, you know, our parents had to raise kids. You know, maybe in the, in the middle, depending how over, old, old you are, you know, maybe they ra raised you in the middle of the war, one of the wars, because the country's been in constant wars, you know. And they, they were afraid, you know, about your dad getting drafted or you getting drafted or, you know, in the middle of a recession or a depression. Yeah. My grandma, I was asking her one time, she, she usually didn't like to talk about the past, but one time I, she was telling me that, because my dad was raised in the depression, and um, she said that she would pretend to have eaten dinner and then give the little food they had to her two kids. 
Yeah. Never told the kids that, of course, you know? And I thought, wow, that's, that's really something. Mm -hmm. And so to think, you know, all these, pe all these living beings, they're in different bodies now with different personalities and different situations, but they've all been kind to me in that way. Yeah. And taught me how to read and write or, you know, whatever was going on, help me. Yeah. And, you know, if, if you look at it, we're still alive today, and that is proof in itself that others took care of us. And even if our parents couldn't take care of us, they made sure somebody did. I read a story a few days ago about a woman. She had, uh, through the, the DNA uh, stuff, she had just found her birth mother and birth father. The story was why she had to look at them, look for them, was uh, her mother uh, obviously, you know, couldn't keep, had her. And when she was three days old, left her in um, the foyer of an apartment building in New York because she couldn't take care of the kid. She didn't have enough money. So she left the child, the three-day-old baby girl, in a shopping bag, covered by sweaters, in the foyer of an apartment building. Not Trump Towers, not a, a big exclusive one, just something, you know, and waited somewhere nearby until somebody came by and found that child in the shopping bag and picked it up. Yeah. And she had written a letter in the, uh, that she put in the, chopping, in the shopping bag just saying how painful it was for her to have to do this, but how she had no money to support the child. She didn't know where the father was, and she even named the baby. And she said, you know, I hope you have a good life. And, you know, I want you to have this name so that you at least have some connection to your past. Yeah. And, and so the, somebody in the apartment building, a 19-year-old kid, found the baby, took it to his mother. They called the police. It got written up in the newspaper. Yeah because this was such a shocking event, finding a baby in a shopping bag. And one guy at the newspaper, who worked in the newspaper, he was, you know, that was publishing the story, he and his wife wanted to have a child, and they didn't, so they adopted this baby. Yeah. And so she grew up, she had a very happy home, and her parents actually told her right from the very beginning the story of how she was left in the shopping bag and all. And showed her the note that her birth mother had lovingly written. But she didn't know who her birth mother and, and father were, you know, until she was an adult and she did the DNA thing. But, you know, you think about that. There was this mother, and it was horrible for her to give up her child. But she was in a situation where she was not able to take care of it. But she made sure someone else could take care of that baby and raise that baby. Yeah? So, you know, when you look at things that way, yeah, even if our parents couldn't take care of us, they made sure somebody else did. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, sometimes when you really think deeply about this, it's, it's, uh, it opens a whole door to thinking about kindness 
that I don't know about you, but that I had never considered before. And it really uh, made me realize that, wow, yeah, spoiled brat me, always wanting more and better, more and better, yeah. Uh, I was actually, uh, yeah, the recipient of amazing kindness. Hmm? So we might say, well, you know, when our parents have us, that's their job. Their job is to take care of us. We didn't ask to be born. Why should we be thankful for what they did? Well, bottom line is we have this precious human life, don't we? And if they didn't have us and if they didn't take care of us, we wouldn't have this opportunity to practice the Dharma. Hmm? So I think uh, important to see other sentient beings in that light. And, you know, not only... Uh, there's two p- factors here. One is to see that who they are now isn't who they've always been and that we've had a, a close relationship. And the other factor is the tremendous amount of kindness they showed us when they were our parents. Okay, so we're in between Mother's Day and Father's Day now. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's good to think of this kind of thing. Yeah. And, and really see how much we have received. Because it totally changes our mind, you know. You were somebody like me who was like, it's not fair, you know. When I was seven, I didn't get to do these things, and now my little brother is six, and he, got, he gets to do what I couldn't even do when I was seven, and it's not fair. And it's going to be a whole year until I have another birthday. Why can't I have a birthday sooner? You know. <laughs> and, you know, so-and-so across the street has these kind of skates. I want these skates, too. Oh, God. Yeah. What parents went through. You know? Really. Yeah. And maybe you were better than I was as a kid. Yeah. I mean I brought home A's, they liked that. But you know, A's so what, you know, when you're a brat. <laughs> yeah, you have an A in being bratty. <laughs> yeah. A plus in being bratty. <laughs> Yeah. So, uh, you know, to, to remember that, that closeness and appreciate that kindness. Yeah. And that really changes how we look at the world. And so then when we see other living beings, instead of feeling like they're distant, there's a feeling, you know, if you remember, kind of even you're intellectually reminding yourself, oh, they were my parents, they took care of me. Even that, then you don't feel like a stranger from them, to them, or with them, whatever the preposition is. You know, you feel that there's some kind of relationship. And even they can't remember and we can't remember, you know, what it was or when it happened, that we've been the recipient of their kindness. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's very moving. They say uh, Lama Atisha, I think, when he traveled to different places, he was a great Indian sage who uh, brought Buddhism to Tibet in the early 12th century. And, uh, was it early 11th? One time. Mm-hmm. Early 11th? Early 12th, some, sometime around there. I majored in history in college. Um <laughs> Yeah, but don't ask me. Uh, and, you know, that, that whenever he would see different beings, you know, he would think, hello, mother. Yeah. And so it's an interesting thing to do. 
you know, when you're in a public place, you know, maybe you're in a mall, although they're all closing now, um, <laughs> you know, or you're in an airport, or, you know, you're in a traffic jam. Look around at everybody and think, you know, they were my parents and they were kind to me. Hmm? Okay. And so when you, you practice thinking like that, then your feeling towards others changes. Yeah. And there, there's uh, no more feeling of being alienated from others. You know, you realize that there's a close connection. So that's one way to generate that sense of closeness. You know, seeing that they've been our parents and they've been kind. There's another way to generate that sense of closeness. And that is to think about how we have benefited from each living being's efforts in this lifetime. Yeah, through what they, their job in society or through whatever they do, you know, how we in one way or another have benefited them. So I already told you how we stopped the other day and thanked the guys working on the road. Yeah, so it's interesting. When your garbage collector comes, go out and thank your garbage connect collector from the bottom of your heart. Garbage collectors are incredibly important people. You know, we think, oh, garbage collectors had a creepy job. Those people are so important. I was in Tel Aviv once when the, the garbage collectors were on strike. That's when you realize how much we depend on the garbage collectors and how kind they are, you know, to collect the garbage. Whew. Yeah, because when they don't, you really experience it. Okay. And so, again, you know, when you're in public places, look around and... You know, uh, we don't know who, what the, uh, you know, jobs or the vocations of all these different people are that we see in public spaces. But they all contribute in one way or another. Whether they work at a job or not, they contribute in one way or another to, uh, to how society functions. And we're dependent on them for their kindness. Okay? So, you know that part of your body that isn't really part of your body that you can't really separate from because you're so attached to that we took away from you when you first came here? Yeah? Your hand phone that you cannot bear to separate from. Yeah. <laughs> Because it's, it's part of your hand, you know, and then she comes along. Did they give you the hand Who collects the hand phones? Who? You. Oh, the two of you did. Okay. Yeah. Did everybody give you their hand phones? <laughs> Were they happy when they gave you their hand phones? Most. Yeah. Anybody argue? <laughs> <laughs> oh yes. Yeah, they need they need their hand phone. Yeah. Because their electric toothbrush is operates in conjunction with their hand phone. <laughs> and it tells you if you've brushed your teeth long enough. So you need to keep your hand phone with you so that you brush your teeth properly. Uh -huh. Right? Yeah. <laughs> Maybe an alarm clock? No, no. They knew they were going to have an emergency? Oh. oh, there was a tool, like a fork. <laughs> yeah? A language tool. Okay. 
So, yeah. They're difficult to give up your handphone, isn't it? Yeah, it's really like, you know, people asking you for part of your body. No, I can't give it to you. I need it. Why isn't it, you know? So you go out with your friends. I've watched this in restaurants. People go out with their friends. Everybody puts their handphone on the table. Yeah? And then you talk with your friends and keep checking your handphone. And then texting your the people on your handphone to make an appointment with them when you can meet them for dinner. And when you meet them for dinner, again, you don't pay attention to them because your handphone is out there, you know, next to your plate and fork. And, and you have to look at your handphone when you're with those people. Yeah. And if you don't look at your handphone, what are people going to think of you? You know, you aren't important. You have nothing going for you. Yeah, because nobody texts you about some, incru some crucially important thing that, like, they ran out of butter. You know? Yeah, the suffering we go through not knowing the latest text message. You know? I don't know. It, it, it seems to me that there's a difference here between here and Singapore. I have to tell my Singapore story. You know. I tell it every retreat. Yeah, you want to tell it for me? <laughs> so in Singapore, when you're going somewhere... Okay, so I'm going to speak at, you know, some temple. The temple is maybe at the longest, you know, a half an hour away. So when we're getting into the car, we call them. We're leaving. Yeah. Then, you know, every five minutes we text them. Okay, oh, now we're on the intersection of this and that. Now we're coming around the corner. Now this, we'll be there in 15 minutes, you know. And so there's at least five text messages that we're sending to them and also a few more that they're sending back to us saying, where are you? Yeah, and come to this entrance, don't go to that entrance. And so-and-so is going to be waiting for you at this entrance. And then they will pick you up and walk you to this, this room. And, you know, just the number of texts that go back and forth instead of just getting in the car and driving somewhere. Yeah? It just amazes me. Yeah? So it, we, yeah. True? Yes. Yeah, very true. Hmm? <laughs> Told you so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so she can also tell you so about how I complain about this. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, yeah. So my point in all this, you know, we went off on the thing about the hand phone, but how many people are involved involved in making your your phone. Yeah? Yeah? So you have to start with the kindness of Alexa. <laughs> or the kindness of Siri. Okay? Who, who is an alias for how many other people? How many people do you think lay behind Siri or Alexa? Yeah? How many of them? How many people? Yeah, you work it. Yeah? A lot? Yeah? Are you Siri or Alexis? Siri, yeah? So how many do you think? A hundred? A thousand? Well, 
Yeah, because they people have to make the hardware of the phone, then they have to make the. Yeah, and then there's the software. And how do they get Siri's voice? Do they take somebody's voice? <laughs> oh, yeah. She has several different accents, doesn't she? <laughs> yeah, but think how many people, yeah, lay behind just the whole inventing of a smartphone. Yeah, and then when you see these people out in public, do you think, oh, you know, I'm benefiting from, from their labor at work? You know, they went to, to work at Apple, is it? Yeah, they went to work at Apple for so long. Does Apple give them free lunch like Google does? Oh. And they sacrifice their lunch to work at Apple when they could have worked at Google and gotten a free lunch? And, you know, and how hard they work you know, to, to make Siri and her everything that's needed for her. Yeah. I mean, it's really amazing, isn't it? I have no idea how those things work. Yeah, really, I, I can't even dial. <laughs> but, yeah, I think I'm the only person who doesn't own a hand phone. Anybody here? Here? Who doesn't own a hand phone? Oh, yeah, all the nuns. <laughs> yeah. All the nuns. But besides the nuns, <laughs> we have a monastery rule about this. <laughs> okay, Ruth, you don't have a, a hand phone? Oh. Larissa, you were kind of... No, you have one. Okay. So... You know, when you think how many people lay behind this and how can you live without it? Uh -huh. So, you know, if you look at everything in your life and think of all the people involved in making it, it's, it's really tremendous, you know, how many people's efforts we benefit from. My teacher was born, one of my teachers, was born in the Solokumbu area of Nepal. And uh, there, what they have to eat uh, is potatoes. And potatoes. <laughs> and potatoes. At least when I was there. I think maybe now they have some other food that they import. But, you know, it was potatoes. And my teacher said, when you know, he would go up there because his previous life was there. So he would sometimes go to the cave where his previous life meditated. And the villagers would bring him potatoes. And occasionally Sampa. Sampa was a big treat. Yeah. And he said that sometimes he would sit there and just look at a potato that somebody brought him and think of everything that person did. Because it was a local farmer, you know, everything that person did to grow that potato. And then how they gave it to him even though he hadn't done anything for them. And he said when he really thought about that sometimes, it was almost as if he couldn't eat the potato because how could he ever repay the kindness of that person who exerted so much effort to make it or to grow it and then out of the goodness of their heart give it to him. 
Okay, so this meditation, the second one of thinking of the kindness of others, is another way really to generate the feeling of closeness with others. Because we see everybody does their different jobs and we benefit. So, okay, there's a trade war with China. China's our enemy because there's a trade war. Where would we be in our lives without China? (laughs) That's right, you wouldn't have a cell phone. And we wouldn't have a lot of the things that we have. Yeah? Might not have a car. Hmm? Yeah, washing machines. Yeah. We wouldn't have the dial. We wouldn't have clothes. Look at your clothes, you know. Where are they made? Look at your furniture. Look at your appliances. You know, read the labels. And instead of just saying, oh, made in Vietnam, made in China, wherever it is. Think, you know, there were living beings who worked hard, you know, to make this thing, and then it got shipped over here. And how much did those people receive for making the things that I use? Especially, like, in Bangladesh, you know? Our clothing that's made in Bangladesh, and how many fires have occurred in the clothing factories where people have gotten killed... Yeah. My grandma worked in the sweat shops in New York, yeah, which have a reputation for being pretty crummy. Yeah. And then I think, you know, these people are working in, you know, their country's version of the sweat shops. Yeah. And then it gets, you know, made and packaged and shipped over here, and then we buy it. And it gets a little bit old, or it isn't the color we want, and we toss it, you know. And do we really think of, you know, what those people went through making those things for us? Do we feel the connection with those people? We may not know them as individuals, yeah, but there are individuals that made those things and were connected to those people. And, and to feel that and think of their lives. What are their lives like? You know, working in a Chinese electronic factory. Yeah? Is that your choice of career? Oh, and so, you know, when we really think about these things, again, the feeling of, wow, you know, Sentient beings have been so kind. And occasionally your mind will chirp up with, but they didn't do it for me specially, so how are they kind? Yeah. They're only kind if they do it for me because they value me as a unique, precious individual. Come on. Okay? You know, we benefited from their labors. It doesn't matter if they did it for us personally or not. You know, the bottom line is if they didn't, we wouldn't have the things we use. Yeah. And so to to be aware of their kindness. Mm -hmm. Okay. Not make them into enemies. Yeah, the average people who are working in these factories or, you know, working on the farms or whatever, they're not the ones making the policies. They're just trying to get by in their lives. Let's see if we can finish this page. (laughs) Yeah, but these meditations are quite important. And that's why I really went into a lot of detail. So this evening, you know, Meditate on the kindness of others using those two methods. One, seeing them as 
having been your parents and thinking of the kindness parents have towards their kids. And then the second, thinking of what they do in society and how, you know, how much benefit you've received from them. So true love and compassion arise on the basis of respecting others. Boy, is that important. Yeah. How can we have love and compassion if we don't respect others? Yeah. If we see them as creeps, as stupid people, if we have contempt for them, yeah. How are we going to develop love and compassion? Yeah. We cannot develop love and compassion if we join in the present political feeling in the, or social feeling in this country. Yeah. We have to go beyond it and grow beyond it if we want to become bodhisattvas. Yeah. I mean, can, could you imagine Chenrezig, you know, kind of appearing and then Chenrezig going, oh, you know, what those people in Congress do and what the president does, and, you know, they're all such stupid idiots. You know, would you, what, what do you think of Chenrezig? <laughs> yeah? And Chenrezig had that kind of attitude. You know? It wouldn't be Chenrezi. Okay. So in the same way, we, we can't become bodhisattvas if we hold on to that kind of attitude towards others. And we can't even be happy people if we hold on to that attitude. So this feeling of empathy is achieved, you know, and so... Respecting others is really important, and empathy is a way to help open our mind to respecting others. So this feeling of emptying, of empathy is achieved by recognizing that you and all others, whether friends, enemies, or neutral parties, share a central aspiration by wanting happiness and not wanting suffering even if you view happiness and suffering differently. Okay. Also, it helps to be aware that over the course of countless lifetimes, everyone at some time has been your mother and your closest friend. With this prerequisite sense of closeness and intimacy with everyone in place, Insight into how sentient beings wander powerlessly in cyclic existence serves to heighten love and compassion. Okay? So you meditated you have on the uh, kindness of others and generated that feeling of closeness. And then you think about how sentient beings are like the bucket in the well and wonder, wander you know, powerlessly in cyclic existence. And that will generate your love and compassion. In the presence of intimacy and insight, the factors of love, compassion, and a desire to help others arise without difficulty. Okay. So it's very much a thing of if you create the causes, the result will come. So if we create the causes of being aware of, of others' misery and of their kindness and generate a sense of closeness, then love and compassion and altruism come without much difficulty. If we don't cultivate those other things as the causes, but just try and generate love and compassion, it's going to be much harder. Okay? So the uh, meditative reflection. So this is what you want to do tonight. Bring a friend to mind. Yeah, so he's saying start with a friend, but don't start with a real close friend. Yeah, because it's, it's, too, it's too easy to become attached to that part person. Start with somebody that you respect, but that you you know, aren't real, real close to. 
towards them because you don't want to generate some attachment to them. Okay, so bring a friend to mind and cultivate these uh, three levels of love. So one, you cultivate this person wants happiness but is bereft of happiness. How nice it would be if he, or, if she or he could be in, imbued with happiness and all the causes of happiness. Actually, there's a lot to meditate on just in that because you have to think of what is happiness and what is the cause of happiness. And there's many different kinds of happiness. And each kind of happiness has a different kind of cause. There's a lot to think about there. Then the second kind of love is to think this person wants happiness but is bereft, same way as the first one. And the first one said how nice it would be if they could be imbued with happiness and its causes. Here, it's not how nice, it's may they be imbued with happiness and its causes. So there's more juice to it. It's not just how nice. It was like, may that actually happen? And then the third level of love is this person wants happiness but is bereft of it. I will do what I can to help them to be imbued with happiness and all the causes of happiness. So the third one is, I will get involved. I will help. Okay? So it, the love has to grow in this progression. It has to start with how nice, and then go to may it happen, and then finally to I will get involved. Okay? So you can see how it has to grow in that kind of manner um, and deepen, you know, in that manner. Okay? Now cultivate three levels of compassion. So one, this person wants happiness and does not want suffering, yet is stricken with terrible pain. So it could be physical, mental pain, but it could be, like we talked this morning, the pain of your happiness not lasting. So that even when you have it, it's not a done deal to remain. Yeah, And then even the dukkha of uh, having a body and mind under the influence of afflictions and karma. Yeah, Which means that we're going to be subject to aging, sickness, and death. Yeah, so just even that is a, a very deep level of dukkha. Okay. So this person wants happiness and does not want suffering, yet is stricken with terrible pain. If this person could only be free of suffering and the causes of suffering. So here again, if only it could be. Then in the second it grows. This person wants happiness and does not want suffering yet is stricken with terrible pain. May this person be free from suffering at its causes. Okay? And so the first, how nice it would be, no suffering. Yeah. Second, may it be. Third, this person wants happiness and does not want suffering, yet is stricken with terrible pain. I will help this person be free from suffering and all the causes of suffering. So that third kind of compassion, again, is I'm going to get involved. Okay. Then, His Holiness instructs, now cultivate total commitment. Okay, so three parts to the commitment. One, cyclic existence is a process driven by ignorance. So to understand that. Two, therefore, it is realistic for me to work to achieve awakening and to help others do the same. And I'll talk about, I'll unpack that tomorrow. And three, even if I have to do it alone, I will free all sentient beings from suffering and its causes and set all sentient beings in happiness and its causes. Okay.
then further instructions for this meditation. One by one, bring to mind individual beings, first friends, and here again, you know, not people you're real close to who you're attached to, but people, you know, that, that you respect. Then neutral persons, then people you don't get along with, Okay, starting with the least offensive. Yeah, so don't start with your worst enemy. And repeat these reflections with them. Okay, so go through all these steps, you know, with specific individuals. His Holiness says, It will take months and years, but the benefit of this practice will be immense. Okay. So the reason that he has us doing it with individuals is it makes it more alive. It makes it more vivid. Yeah. If we just think, may all the people in Washington State have happiness in its causes, it's too ambiguous. It's too ambiguous. You know, we need to think of, you know, may the people living in tents under Highway 5 in Seattle have happiness in its causes. Okay, if you live in Seattle and you drive by those people living in tents on the crooks, you know, off the highway. Uh, or may the, may the people, you know, living in the downtown sections of major cities, you know, have, you know, if, if we just think abstractly, we need to make it much more personal. Okay, not just everybody. Yeah, may the may the ro farmer down the road, yeah, whose crop is not growing properly, yeah, may they have happiness in its causes. Yeah, and you may or may not have ever spoken to that farmer who lives down the road, but you've seen them. Yeah, you live by them. You know something about what their life is like just by living close to them. Okay? So you make it personal in this way. And then keep expanding the people. <laughs>